the screen around just so I can actually see the text. Um, Ma Maureen is probably known to many people on the call. Uh, she's been associated with the Friends for, well, really since it began. Um, she's going to be speaking on Orchids of Frontenac Park and the Kingston region. Um, she's an avid amateur naturalist and uh, has built up a, a great knowledge of the biology of the Frontenac Park area uh, and, and the area around it. Um, and uh, tells me she's been traveling across the province and, and further afield um, researching rare plants as well. So thank you. So, so Maureen has been a member of the Friends uh, since it began. Uh, one time we had a natural history group of uh, Dora Hunter, who I think is on the call, Tom Marsh and Maureen, who, who uh, are keen researchers uh, for exploring the park and, and for finding new things. And Maureen uh, discovered an orchid in the park that until that time was not known to exist in the area. And I think it's turned out to be one of the biggest concentrations of orchid in Eastern Ontario. And so her presentation today will cover that story and, and many others. So Maureen's with me right now. Um, so I'll, I'll probably do a highly technical thing and, and turn the camera uh, um, and uh, switch over, over to that. Yes. So uh, I'll just, sorry, I'm just gonna check that she, she's in the view. I'll just stop sharing a minute. Uh, quite, there we go. So I can put a bit of light on the thing as well. Um, so, but for the bulk of this, we'll be doing a screen share. So, um, so there we go. Um, okay, then. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, and uh, we're ready to go. So I'll just, again, start sharing screen again. And, um, but I'll leave you on the view. And share, and I will go to uh, Lightroom. Um, are we sharing yet? Oh, there, there, there's the unofficial <laughs> view of Maureen. We were like, just looking at these. <laughs> before the lecture and <laughs> anyway yes that's that's the unofficial view um and i'm, I'm just going to go to the orchid uh, show now sorry yes there we are so and uh let's really try and find it okay orchid presentation oh, and here we are number one and we'll resume okay then so so hoping everybody is seeing uh a Yellow lady slipper <laughs> orchid, and I'll hand over to Maureen now. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank Simon uh, for putting uh, Tom Marsh's slides into the format you're now going to view. All the photos, with the exception of two, were taken by Tom Marsh, and some of you will remember him. He died in uh, 2004. Um, we, I have always been interested in plants, natural history, especially plants. And I am a charter member of the Kingston Orchid Society. Uh, and I still have a few phalaenopsis that I, I take care of. But once I found my first wild orchid, I was hooked. And I wanted to find as many of the wild orchids that grow in front that Kingston region, which uh, is west to Brighton, north to Smith Falls, and east to Brockville. And it was very fortunate for me to meet up with two like-minded people, Tom Marsh and Dora Hunter. And over the seven years, we hiked, canoed, winter camped, frog monitoring at night in Frontenac Park, hiked into the winter melt ponds in early spring to monitor the spotted and the blue spotted salamanders. Um, we did the frog monitoring and salamander research um, midweek at night. And many times we were in the park well after midnight um, and Dora and I were working at the time, <laughs> uh, Tom took photos of everything. And um, the orchid photos we will see today, he took with the exception of two. So this is um, the yellow lady slipper. This was the first, this not this particular plant, but the first orchid I ever, I ever saw was the yellow lady slipper. And that was up around Mountain Grove. I was with a friend we're driving along a trail. And when I saw that, I yelled, stop that truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, they're so exotic looking and growing in the forest. So um, this was taken actually in Front Neck Park. Go to the next one. Mm -hmm. And this one, I remember specifically, this was taken early in the morning because we used to start hiking. Well, they used to pick me up between seven and 7.30 or I would pick them up. So we'd be up at the park, you know, not long afterwards. This is at the north end of the park and, the, and it's in the forest in the woods. 
and the sun is just at the right angle. It's just shining through the back of the plant and it gives that beautiful coloration to it. And this was taken also in Frontenac Park. All the yellow ones were in Frontenac Park. Um, the yellow orchid, um, it's uh, Cypripedium parviflorum uh, variation pubescence. And it grows in the woods. It likes some shade and, and some moisture. It grows in low-lying wooded areas. It's not like some of the ones we'll see later on. We can go again. Now, this wasn't taken in Frontenac Park, but taken in another place where I like to hike. It's also a yellow lady slipper, but it's very tiny. I should have had something to sort of show you how small those flowers are. This is um, Cypripedium parviflorum, but variety Matheson. And it grows in clumps and it's very low to the ground. The flowers are very tiny and they've got a beautiful perfume to them. So this is not from Frontenac Park, but definitely within the Kingston region. Let me go to the next one. And it's another picture of a just slightly different um, showing, you know, what it's like. You can see it is shorter. Uh, the next one too, you know, let's just stay on too long. Mm -hmm. There's a close up, which is really, really pretty. I, I really like it. Um, the smell is, is amazing, but you have to get down on your hands and knees because it's so short mm -hmm. to, uh, and it grows, we found it growing in ditches that were sort of semi-moist. So it does like that kind of territory. That's the, yeah. same, that's the same one. I probably just want to admit somebody, the screen goes. Oh like yeah, all oh, right, so. yeah, um, okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is also Cypripedium acaulei, and this is from the park and it grows in, gosh, sort of it likes it dry upland um mainly around the shield uh i don't know most people would probably know where rock dunder is if you ever wanted to see a display you know it doesn't happen every year but i happened to be there one year with my sister and there were thousands of acaulies blooming it was amazing my sister kept taking the pictures as well they're all the same when you have to take so many for but they're absolutely beautiful you can go to the next this is a close-up of the uh, of the flower, but and it is a lady slipper. You know, the slipper is slightly different than the than the yellow lady slipper. This is um, alba form, and it's not a true albino because the leaves aren't white, but it's just missing the pigment, which makes it pink. And we only ever found this one year. We checked every year afterwards, but we never ever saw it again for some reason. Uh, probably most of you will know where these are from. This is from Purden, and it's um, the Queen Orchid or Cypripedium regini. And it's our biggest lady slipper and very prolific uh, up, in, up at Purden. I actually, um, being a member of the Kingston Orchid Society, um, we used to travel around and put on displays of orchids. And now they weren't wild orchids. They were all the, you know, the, the kind you buy in the store. But um, Marilyn Light, she got some of the members of the Kingston Orchid Society to come up to Purden and uh, try and keep it clear so that um, the sun would get in and, and keep them coming up because I mean, there is, it's in a fen, but there's a lot of other growth in the fen, which is blocking up the sun. So she is a microbiologist, but she was a member of the American Orchid Society. So they did a lot of work in clearing um, some of the um, trees and stuff, just cutting them back so that the sun could get to these. And that's just a close up. They, they're so beautiful. You can't help taking pictures of them. And it, it is the largest. And they also grow, well, gosh, up where my sister lives in um, Gray County, they're growing along the side, of, in the ditches along the sides of the road. You can't help but stop and look. Uh, there's so many of them. And that's another picture of them too, from the same, same place in Purden. And they were really, um, they're blooming earlier because we missed them this year. Used to be, as the Mississippi Valley looks after that particular site, and it used to be Father's Day weekend was the time to go, but I went Father's Day weekend and they were finished. There was the odd one, but the, the main um, groupings were all finished. And this is also Cypripedium. Uh, this is the ram's head, Cypripedium ariatinum. 
it's really hard to see. This is sort of shows the habitat. Uh, this is not from Frontenac Park either. It's from a wooded area that's um, just, just west of here. But when you first go into the woods and it's right in the woods, you can't see anything. And then your eyes become adjusted and you pick up these little things. And I mean, it's so tiny in comparison to others. Uh, it's called the ram's head because the flower is supposed to resemble a ram's head, but I don't really see it myself. But anyway, and there's a close up of it. It's, it's a very, you, you couldn't miss it. I mean, it's, it's a very unique flower. I have seen it growing uh, up in uh, Bruce Gray County again, um, growing with um, gay wings. If anybody knows what, what gay wings are, um, it was growing with them and they sort of seemed to bloom at the same time. But I mean, I see gay wings in front of that park, but never the, the ram's head. I'm always looking though. <laughs> Next one, yeah. And there's another picture of uh, the Ariadium. And you can keep going. It grows at, in among the cedars. There's a really close up. Tom was really great with the uh, camera and he didn't use a camera with a light meter. So I got to hold the light meter. <laughs> and you know, I would be, I had the light meter and he'd say closer or farther away. So as a consequence, all the photos he took, I have copies of them all. They're all in, in um, albums. So anytime I want to see something and I've got frogs, salamanders, you name it, they're all in my <laughs> books. Okay, next one. This is um, Candidum, which is really rare, Cypripedium Candidum. And unlike the other orchids, this one is quite different in the fact that it likes the full sunlight and it grows in a marl bed. And um, this orchid is only known from a couple of places in Ontario and people sort of guard it <laughs> where it grows. Um, this grows on some property that's owned by Ontario Nature. And that um, grows on little hummocks, but the little raised hummocks are in a marl bed, which is, kind of limey soil and you sink down into it. It's almost like quicksand. We'll see a few more later on. This is the area, Sorry. whoops. <laughs> um, yeah, there. Um, this is the same orchid in the same location. It, you just can't help but take pictures of them. And if you look inside the slipper, there's little, uh, well, you can see some of them on the left one. There's little, um, purple lines, which some people say shows the bee where to go when it gets into mm -hmm. the slipper, how to get the, uh, you know, the pollen. Okay, go again. Oh, you did yeah. get them in the right order. Yeah. You did, great. <laughs> I didn't realize you Sometimes. had. <laughs> um, this is the same one again. And you can see, actually, you can see the purple even inside the uh, the little slipper on, on the one on the right and on the left. Do you want me to enlarge it? Or? Uh, yeah, just for okay. fun to see. Okay. I've never yeah. seen it enlarged. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, okay. that's enlarged. That's enlarged. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, there's the yeah. purple. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So that's mm -hmm. supposed to guide the insect to where the pollen yeah. is. Mm -hmm. So we better go back to the, okay. the normal. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a Plectum hyamali, and it grows in Front Neck Park, and it grows throughout the park. I have found it in many, many different locations. Um, if you look at any orchid books, it's, it likes the um, upland deciduous woods. I've only seen it once. It was found by um, Faye Dennis uh, when it was... Uh, by some pine trees, which is really unusual. And it's got, um, it's, it's quite different in the fact that it, it puts up a leaf in the fall when the leaves are off the trees and late, you know, October, November, um, this orchid puts up a leaf and it overwinters, which is very, very rare. And I, I think there's some pictures later on that shows it. Um, you can just go back to the ordinary because yeah. it's, it's kind of, Foggy looking yeah. there. There is some close-ups of the flowers, so we'll go to the next one. So this is the leaf uh, when it first comes up. So it's vertical, 
And it's quite a different kind of leaf in that it's it's pleated and it makes it look like it's green and white striped. So like I said, it grows in a lot of places in the park. And once uh, you can go to the next, I think it's those. So once it, there's a better picture, once the leaf is up completely, then it, it goes horizontal to pick up as much of the sunlight as it can get from the, the, the leafless trees. This is just another picture sort of showing the habitat and those are seed pods from, from probably that year. Because what happens um, when it blooms, the leaves die. So you don't, you don't see any sign of it until the fall again, late fall, when it comes up and you can find it in the snow. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go ahead to the next one. And it's called putty root is one of the common names or Adam and Eve. So um, Tom just wanted to dig up the, the corms just so you could see. Uh, the reason it's called putty root is settlers used to dig them up and they'd mash it together they mashed them all up and they used it to putty any leaks around the windows. So that's why it was called putty root. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonder, it always has two corms. So one dies off each year and it produces a new one. So it always has two. And that's where the Adam and Eve comes in. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the next one again. Mm -hmm. And this is the flower uh, spike first coming up. And it's very slow. You can see the leaf is already starting to die. You can go to the next one too. And there it is in full bloom and the leaf is already gone. So it's not the most beautiful flower and, but it's, you know, it's not a, a, an orchid that you're gonna run into every day. It is kind of rare. Um, a lot of times you step back and it disappears, you know, because it blends in so well with mm -hmm. the, the undergrowth. So you can go to the next one too. And that's a, a better close up of it. It's quite pretty, so, and they are slightly, there's different colorations of it. And apparently there's a green one, some kind of, but we've never seen, they've always looked like this, all, all the ones I've ever, I've ever seen. And I can't remember how many different parts of the park. It grows absolutely everywhere, but not low down. It, it likes it higher up. And sometimes near water too, or rotten logs, you know, trees that are downed and, and they're starting to decay, it'll grow there. And that's an, another close-up of the flower, which isn't a very good one. I will take that out when I get to the, back to the slide. Okay. And that's, that shows you a close-up. You can see the coloration is kind of different in that flower than it was in the ones that they were more yellow. So there are some color variations. But the leaf is the dead giveaway, and you have to find that in the fall. Then you know where to go back and look. It does balloon pretty early, usually June, not July. So, and probably blooming even earlier now with climate warming. Okay, you can go to the next one. This is Gudira pubescens. This is another orchid that is in quite a few places in the park. Um, the uh, common name for it is um, rattlesnake plantain. And I think that's because of the, the actual rosette of flowers, it's like a plantain. And the rattlesnake comes from the actual leaf. Now there's quite a few varieties of Goodyear, but the only one we get is, is this one here, the pubescence. I've seen repens and I've seen a blongifolia, um, but they just don't grow here. It's just the, this particular one. They are evergreen. And if you find a colony, you, you'll find them there all year round. They'll be under the leaves and stuff for protection, you know, when the leaves come off the trees, but it's really pretty. That's the next one. And this is um, another picture of it. There used to be quite a colony where Archon meets the Trail of the Little Salmon, and but it has diminished quite a bit, that colony. Um, it seems to be happening everywhere. I'll let you go to the next one. That's a close up of the leaves. They are very, very pretty. And I mean, a lot of people might want it just for the leaf alone. Mm -hmm. And the next one will be the flower again. That's a close up of the, of the flower. So it is really pretty. So that's a Goodyera pubescence or rattlesnake plantain. It's named after Goodyera, it's named after the person that first discovered it. <laughs> you can go to the next one. Now, this one is um, a Platanthera dilatata. And it sometimes you'll see it at um, Purden, the odd time there's a flower there. 
It's got the most wonderful perfume. It's the tall white bog orchid and it smells like cloves. Now, orchids do hybridize because people hybridize, you know, the, the ones uh, that are grown in greenhouses all the time. And you can go to the next one. This is uh, Hyperborea, um, Platantha Hyperborea. And the two orchids were called the two sisters because they were so much alike, except this one, the flowers are kind of greenish. And there's a third one, you can go to the next one. This is Platanthra hurinensis. Now, initially they thought it was a cross between the Hyperborea and the Dilatata because the flowers are kind of between white and green and they did have a, a slight perfume, but no, it's been made a separate species. Whoever the botanists got together and figured out it's not a, um, it's not a combination of the two, it's actually a separate species. So that's Plotanthera hurinensis. I think it was found on the shores of Lake Huron, obviously <laughs> to be called hurinensis. The next one. This is one of my favorite orchids, um, Plotanthera psychodes. It is absolutely beautiful and I haven't seen one for a long time. This is in Frontenac Park and um, you can show the next one, which is, there is a close up of the flowers. One of the common names is butterfly orchid. Um, it grows, when we first saw it, it was growing in sort of wet areas and it was, there was a stream that came down into a valley out of a, a pond and it was growing or it was sort of wet and, and it grew along the sides of the stream. And this one, it was so big, we thought it was a grandiflora because there's another one that's bigger, but no, this one, the leaves were so big, they were like a corn stalk. It was the most amazing orchid. And we had, um, I had a friend from Alberta with me at the time and he found quite a few. Um, he, uh, he, is an, he is president of the Alberta Orchid Society. He's a professor at the University of Alberta and he grows orchids, but he's crazy because they don't get this one out west. So we've got some that they don't get and vice versa. But this picture is just beautiful. Tom took it too. <laughs> this, mm -hmm. this is Cernua, uh, one of the Speranthes. This is, um, there's quite a few different Speranthes. And there's a little story about the Cernua. Um, it, they decided, and Dr. Paul Catling was one of the ones involved in this and splitting it into two different kinds of Speranthes. And uh, this one, this Cernua is very, very white. And they decided that there was another one that looks very much like this, but it grows in dry areas. And they named it after Frederick Case and they called it Casei, Speranthes Casei. And um, he has written book, a really good orchid book uh, called Orchids of the Western Great Lakes region. So this is Cernua, and I have found it many times growing along the shores of um, Big Salmon Lake and the KCI, you can go to the next one, I think the next one will be KCI. No, that's, that's a close up. Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can go to the next one. That's just a close up of the flowers. Um, the other one grows sort of in drier areas. I've seen it growing, believe it or not, up where my sister lives in gravel along the side of the road. And so, but I think that one has been split up again um, because uh, Todd Norris sent me something that got a, a completely different name. And I can't even remember what it is because I lost the, I lost the actual, um, thing he sent me. <laughs> um, you, you can go ahead again. There's a close up of the flowers of the KCI. They're really, really hard to identify. Um, there's only one that you always know the name of because it has a green throat. All the others have a yellow throat and they bloom at different times of the year. Um, you can go ahead. They're not particularly pretty. This is the one that you always know what it is. Mm -hmm. This is um, Speranthes, um, Lacera, and it has a green throat and it really twists around. The common name is ladies' tresses. It's supposed to kind of look like braids that someone would be wearing. Um, 
but I don't see it. But this one blooms first. You always see this one first, and it's early July. They bloom right into quite late in the season. Um, I just found actually Ben, my friend Ben came out from Alberta and we went orchidizing and we found Case's orchid. And this was in, oh gosh, October. So it was late, but we did find quite a few growing on the shield because it's like I said, Case's likes that, you know, the shield sort of high dry. I've seen them growing right on the shield, right beside the rock and everything. And, uh, and like I said, where my sister lives, um, she lives on the escarpment uh, in, in Gray County, and they are growing out of the gravel. I couldn't believe it at the side of the road, but we go on to the next. And that's a close-up of the last row. You can see the green throat. If you look at them with a magnifying glass, it, it's the white is like crystalline. It's like little shiny little, oh, I don't know. They're just so pretty if you look at them under the microscope. Okay, we can go ahead. There, that's the same one again. This shows the, the habitat, and you probably won't notice, but down in the right hand corner there, there's another orchid. And I didn't notice it until um, we had the, the picture developed. It's the green molasses. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, it's right there. I have more pictures of them, you'll okay. see later on, but. I mean, it's uh, it's quite amazing that that you know that it's it's um, yeah. yeah. So that's mm -hmm. um, Molaxis unif unifolia because it, it just has the it has the one leaf. This one um, it'll 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 be a little bit later. We'll see some more pictures of it. But um, this is one orchid that I found. Uh, we were also looking for new orchids. We found this one. Then we never saw it again for years. If conditions aren't right, one thing orchids will do is they just won't come up. They just stay underground until the conditions are right. And I'm beginning to, you know, wonder where in the heck are we ever going to see another green molasses? Mm -hmm. But um, there, lo and behold, one one year we got another one. Then go to the next one, and that's a that's a better picture. Looking at them from the top. They look like little faces, the little buds. They're, they're quite different. They're much prettier, but you can see the bottom flowers are already finished, um, already finished blooming. And it's, as you can see, it's quite short, very low to the ground. Okay. This is also Malaxis, uh, but it grows in a completely different area. Um, this is uh, Malaxis brachypoda. Um, it only has one leaf too, uh, but this is taken in a swamp. It grows in really wet areas where the green molasses grows up by the, you know, in the high and dry, right beside um, shield rocks. So they're quite different. Um, uh, just to let you know, over the years, I have found 19 species of orchids in Front Neck Park. I know that's hard to believe, but and that's not all of them because I've never found Coeloglossum yet, and I haven't found uh, Platanthera hookeri. I found uh, Platanthera hookeri at uh, Rock Dunder, one plant. But um, according to Ian McDonald, who did the original species list, um, both those orchids do grow in Front Neck Park, or they did when he did the species list. So, okay. Just looking at my notes here so I don't miss anything. And this is a picture of um, Malaxis brachypoda again, only it's got two leaves. It's not supposed to have two leaves, but it was in this swamp that I call super swamp. But I can tell you where else it grows down Big Salmon Lake Road on the left hand side, there's quite a swamp down mm -hmm. below. It does grow there because. Um, one year, Tom and Dora and I hiked through that swamp, <laughs> looking, uh, we got meat and alive with mosquitoes. But um, anyway, we found it in that swamp too. So hmm. they may be small, but uh, you know, you don't see them all that often. And I guess because they're small, but I didn't go to the next one. And this is um, the Platanthera clevelata or the little club spur orchid. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later. We did find some really neat orchids 
And we found this one, just the leaves. We knew it was an orchid, but we had no idea what it was. We had to go back. And this is like a two hour, a two hour hike in to get to the swamp. We went back, I don't know how many times until we finally saw it in bloom and we knew what it was, then we could find it. So that's what you have to do if you're after orchids. You can go to the next one. And that's a close up. They call it clevelada, the little club spur, because um, it does look like a little club there. Um, the lip coming down looks like a club. So that's uh, how it gets the name. You can go to the next. And that's just another, um, another picture of it there. Um, I think, or maybe that's themselves. Hang on a second. Is yes, a it is. Um, it's uh, it's the Zealous Tway Blade. We're in this super, what I call super swamp. Um, it's uh, Leporis Lazellii is the Latin name, or just uh, the Zealous Tway Blade. It's quite common. And there you can see that it had been growing there other years because there's the seed pods. And um, you can go to the next one. And that's just a, a close up of it again. Um, there's actually in this swamp, and you, you'll hear the story in a few minutes, uh, there's two toy blades. And this one is more common. The other one is the one that I discovered that had never been seen uh, from, because this is Southern species. So you can go to the, the next picture. Um, this is just to show you, uh, it's the same orchid again. It's the Zell's toy blade. And it just shows you what the habitat and what it was like. What, what it's growing in, it's growing on moss, and you can see the seed pods on that too. So we can go to the next one. Now, this is the big one. This is the one that caused a, a big commotion. Um, we were hiking that day, we set out hiking, and Tom said, let's try and find a new orchid. <laughs> <laughs> so we went by the swamp, which we've gone by a million times, it was an amazing swamp. It had trees growing in it. We saw scarlet tanagers up in one of them. They had a nest up near the top. Uh, there were trees on the hummocks. There were hummocks, so the, you know the trees weren't in right in the water, but there was water everywhere. There was rotting logs. There was ferns that were so high that once you got into the middle of the swamp, you actually got lost. I mean, it was it was really big. And I'm walking along and Tom was behind me and I looked and I saw this orchid and I thought, holy mackerel, I know that orchid. I, I knew it from a book. I never bothered reading about it because I knew it wouldn't grow here. It's a southern species. So, and I, I was saying to Tom, Tom, it's an orchid. <laughs> no, that's not an orchid. That must be a Lizelle's toy blade. No, no, it's not. It's Liliofolia, Liliopholia, Liliopholia. I've seen it in the book. I had a hard time trying to do it to talk them into what it really was. So um, it was one of the most exciting days of my life finding this orchid because it wasn't supposed to grow there. So Tom took some pictures of it. Um, when he had them developed, he sent it to um, the NHIC in Peterborough, the Natural History Information Center. And of course they were really excited. They, they we had told Karina Badar, who was in charge of that area, you know, the parks in that area, our area at the time, and she showed it, you know, she told someone we had found it and they said, oh, it couldn't be that. It doesn't grow here. And she said, well, if they said it's what it is, it's got to be right because they know they're orchids. So this was so exciting. You can go to the next one. We took quite a few pictures of it. And the day we actually took it, um, it was a terrible day and it started to pour rain. And Tom was trying to take a picture of it underneath his coat and <laughs> jacket. <laughs> and so... Uh, but he did get a, a good enough one to send. Uh, and then we just mm -hmm. took all kinds of photographs of it. So it's quite a bit like, when it's not in bloom, it's quite a bit like the Lazelle's toy blade. But the only thing is um, the pedestals, which hold the actual flower, they're a lot longer. You can see, and, and the thing that's shocked me right. is they've been blooming for quite a few years. Uh, that's the pedestal there where the actual seed capsule has fallen off of it. So in, in Lazelle's toy blade, it's a lot shorter than that. It's about half that length because the leaves are very similar. Um, this one, the leaves are a little bit wider than the Lazelle's toy blade, but, you know, and, and that's the habitat. It's growing on moss. And believe it or not, some of them are growing in water. This swamp 
was amazing in that it never got overflowing with water because at the one end of the swamp was a hole in the wall. It was quite high and, and there was a hole in the wall. And if there was any overflow, it went into that hole and came out in a lake. Mm -hmm. So it kept it at a constant sort of, I mean, it got a, in the spring, it got a bit with all the ice and snow melting, but these were growing in water. You can go to the next one again. We took quite a few, you can see the habitat there. Oh, there's the pedestal. You can see how long it is there with the seed pod and the leaves are wider than the cells. But I was so excited that, that day to find that because I knew it's not supposed to grow here. And I think it grows in Southwestern Ontario somewhere, but not nowhere else. You can go to the next one. And there's a close up of the flower. The lip is kind of purpley, but you know, it's like all the orchids, you step back a few feet and it just disappears into the background. They're really, really hard to see. But what happened with this one? Um, we had David uh, White come in. He's a botanist in Lanark County. The friends hired him to come in and we did a site assessment of the swamp. And Tom and Dora and I helped him do it. We spread out, we were like sort of I don't know, so many feet apart. And we just went back and forth across the swamp until we covered it all. We only counted blooming plants because of Lazelle's and David wanted to make sure he didn't make a mistake. And we counted over 300 plant, blooming plants. Wow. A big, yeah. big, the biggest colony ever, ever known. Okay, mm -hmm. we can go on to the next. And there it is, it's growing in the water here. You can't really see the water, but, um, not only did we find it in this swamp, but there was a stream coming down from another swamp above this, and it was growing up there too. So I've checked so many places to see if I could find it, but it disappeared. And I don't want to tell you what happened to it because it breaks my heart every time I think of it, but I will tell you. The beaver saw the hole and put a dam there and right in front of the overflow and, and blocked oh, it all up wow. and I mean it's just what happens you can't do anything about it and Bert actually put a rake up there because he thought anybody we could we could keep it because it was a very short dam it was only about two feet well then the beaver after we'd taken it down a few times they got really wise and they built this great big dam right across <laughs> the whole end of it. and the swamp it died everything died in it because it was completely flooded and then a few years later um, I don't know what happened, but it came back and I thought, oh, great. We found everything in it that we'd seen before. And there were five species of orchids in that swamp, believe it or not. And um, including the yellow lady slipper, which I count as, as the fifth one, but there was the two tway blades. Uh, there was the, the Malaxis brachypoda and the clevelata, and, you know, mm -hmm. they all died. And so we found, when it came back for the second time, we found everything except Liliopholia. And in the meantime, I had gotten to know um, Dr. Paul Catling, who was at the experimental farm at the time. Uh, he's re since retired. He is amazing. His um, resume is as long as your arm. He's an expert in everything. And I actually met, got to meet him because I did bring him to the park, which we'll talk about in a, a little bit later. But he keeps insisting that it'll probably come back. There's got to be seeds around mm -hmm. somewhere. And, and, but I think I'm getting too old for the long hike up there mm -hmm. <laughs> to check. Let me go to the next. And this is, uh, this is a funny story, too. This is um, Epipactus helleborine, and it's growing outside of Tom's house. And I've got this amazing orchid book that was written in 1920, well, it was written in 1929, but the research was done in, you know, uh, 1904. And this orchid had just come to North America. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, from, it's from Eurasia. And it's Morris and Ames, Our Wild Orchids. This is book, and it's the most incredible book ever written about orchids, even though it's old. Uh, it had just arrived and he's sort of pondering to himself, I wonder what this orchid is going to be like in a few more years. If they only knew it grows everywhere. <laughs> in fact, people call it the weed orchid. But, you know, if it was rare, it would 
be highly sought after because I mean the flowers are pretty you can I think there's a, another there's picture a, of it yeah. look at the close-up of the flower I mean it's it's prettier than the one you're going to see in a few minutes it's just positively ugly but because it's so common nobody thinks anything much of it um okay you can go to the next okay here's the one that's ugly <laughs> um we were hiking and um there is a great big shield rock and if it, it's right on the trail and if you go around the other side of the rock it sort of goes downhill there's maidenhair spleenwort one of the ferns i really really love and i was checking it and i walked along you know past there's a lot of um uh, beech trees there i walked along and i saw this thing and i said to tom that's an orchid i knew it was a coral root they don't produce chlorophyll um this Coralariza odontariza, which is the autumn coral root that I didn't know at the time. I knew it was a coral root, but I wasn't sure. There's quite a few of them. And I let uh, Dr. Paul Catling know I had found it. Oh, he was really excited because it's only ever been found in the Trenton area in 1977. And he wanted to come and see it. And we missed a year. He was sick the one time, and I had to be really careful because this blooms quite late. Tom and I found it in September, and every year I did the challenge or the trek. I always checked. I never ever saw it again. Just that one time, until a few years ago, I I found it, and that's when I let uh, Paul Catling know. Well, he knew I found it, but you know I'd never seen it the second time to, to get him in. Mm -hmm. So I went up and we found quite a few. I took him and his wife, Brenda, on a blistering hot day. It must have been about 40. And um, I was so afraid they might not be there because they don't last very long. They, this particular colony, it's the ugliest little thing because the flowers don't open. It has what they call Christogamous flowers. So obviously it self-pollinates because um, there's nothing for any insect to, to come and pollinate. And some colonies are like that. Sometimes there's one or two plants in the colony where they'll actually bloom. It's a tiny little flower, purple and white, but this happened to be um, non, you know, Christogamous flowers, but I knew it was a coral root. Again, I had a fight with Tom because he said, no, it isn't, it's beach drops. I said, that's not beach drops. So I had to take him home, show him the picture in the book, and then we, we got really excited. So, but we never, all the times with Tom, we never ever found it again. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next one. And there it is, a close up. And you can see the little things at the end of the seed capsules. One thing about orchids, every seed capsule, whether it's big or small, ascending or descending or at right angles, they're all like barrel staves. They're like little barrels and the little staves open and the seeds are expelled that way. So I knew, you know, there was no doubt in my mind that it was an orchid. So um, anyway, so when I, when I had um, Brenda and, and Paul up and we're sitting having lunch, I said to him, yeah, it's only been found in one other place in, uh, in Ontario in Trenton, 1977. And he had, all of a sudden he had this shy smile on his face and I said, you found it, didn't you? He said, yes, I did. So I don't know whether it's very rare, but I don't know whether it's very rare because it's so tiny. You might never find it in, in other vegetation. Uh, I, I just don't know, but it's only been found twice. No one else has ever, ever seen it. And the, the coral root is quite a big family. I have seen a lot of the others, like striata and some of the others up on the Bruce Peninsula. But uh, I was so excited to find this one too. <laughs> you can go to the next one. Um, this is Galliera spectabilis, or the showy orcus. And uh, poor Ben, we hiked into the place where I've always found it. And guess what? We couldn't find a single flower. And he's sort of giving me a look like, are you sure that they used to be here? <laughs> and, I hike sometimes with Karen Stinson and she lost her lens. We were looking at them through her lenses and she lost her lens. Well, guess who found it then? So I said, that proves that we were, we were here. It grows in, in Frontenac Park and in quite a few different areas of the park, but it seems to be getting, I mean, where this one is, there used to be a lot of them, like a real colony. And again, some years, it's in a valley, it's quite low down, and it can get quite wet. So I don't know whether there was too much rain 
but I found one plant with one leaf and that was all. And other years I've seen like, you know, 20 or 30 of them growing together. This is the only picture I have of, of the Galliaris spectabilis. Showy orchis is the common name. So we can go to the next. Now this orchid, we're coming to a really interesting story. This is Rose Pagonia or Pagonia opheoglossides. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the most beautiful little orchids. Um, I just love it. And it grows in a swamp. It also grows along wet. I've seen it growing along Big Salmon Lake, um, which is really on the south, the south shore. Uh, you can go to the next one because you have a few pictures. There's a close up of the flower. It's just the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I had found this one years ago. I used to hike with a friend, Diane Lawford, and uh, we were at the lake where this grows, and one of the places it grows, and we saw these pink flowers, and, and we raced over, and that was a new orchid to me. I was really excited to find them, and that was years ago, and then we rediscovered it again with, with Tom and Dora. You can go to the next one. And that's just another picture of it, another close-up, and you can go again. Okay, this is the grass pink, and this swamp that these orchids are growing in, and uh, also a rose begonia grows in there too. This is um, um, Calipogon tuberosus, is the Latin name. Um, it's called grass pink because the leaves are kind of grass like. The place where these grow, you can see the habitat, it's kind of mosses and, uh, and small ferns, nothing big to sort of block out the, um, the orchids. They're growing on floating mats in this swamp. And I mean, it, it's, it's a beautiful orchid and I just love it. And so I was reading in my books because I wanted to just, you know, read up about them. And in the book, it said there was a third orchid that grew with, with these two. And uh, you can go to the next one there. There is a close up. That's just a, an amazing photograph of the grass pink. And I'll tell you how we got it, uh, how we got that photograph in just a minute here. You can go to the next one again. Okay, <laughs> here's Tom Marsh out in the middle of the swamp. We had our binoculars with us, and this is where the orchids are growing on those floating mats. Now, not all of them float, but if there's a high wind, and you might recognize people that know Frontenac really well, might recognize the lake, I'm not gonna name it. Um, but anyway, we had our binoculars with us, and we could see the pink orchids, but we couldn't tell for sure whether the third one was there. So I think we came back up midweek because the orchids don't stay in bloom all that long. And uh, one by one, Adora went first. She's always the brave one. Um, we blew up the air mattress and we went out one by one on the air mattress. And sure enough, it was the dragon's mouth orchid or Arethusa bulbosa, the third orchid. You can, you can take a picture. And this is the picture of it. Um, but I have to tell you how we got these amazing photographs. Um, of course, you can't take pictures on an air mattress. So I think it must have been the weekend. Um, I don't think Dora was with us the first time. I, I can't, oh no, she was with us because I remember uh, we took the canoe in and that was quite the thing. Uh, we had to go down Big Salmon. We crossed over into Little Clear, got out at number nine and then went up the trail and bushwhacked into the lake. And we passed someone on the on the trail and they said, you know, this isn't a portage. We said, oh, we know. <laughs> they thought we were nuts. Here we are with a 16-foot canoe. And all that. So anyway, wow. um, we got into, into this lake and I don't think there was a loon's nest and I think they were shocked. I don't think anybody had ever mm -hmm. been on this lake in a canoe before. It's more like a, they call it a lake, but it's more like a swamp. It was full of um, bloodsuckers and leeches. And then, you know, the kind that stretch out and then it gets small. Uh, so even on the air mattress, you kind of, uh, you know, I had on um, uh, my water shoes and I had on tights. So I didn't want to have to have a bathing suit on. You can go to the next one. So that's just another picture that we got. So anyway, when we got onto the pond or onto this lake, or swamp or whatever you want to call it, uh, it is called a lake, by the way. Um, it was a terribly, terribly hot day. I remember it was cloudy and it was one of those days where it was windy, but hot, just like a, a desert wind. 
And here we are, Dora and I trying to keep the canoe from rocking. And Tom's hanging over the bow, getting the pictures. And this, and, oh, it's just the most beautiful orchid, Arethusa bulbosa. And I think it's named, I think Arethusa was a nymph, a Greek nymph or something. Mm -hmm. It's named after, mm -hmm. after that. But it's supposed to be one of the most spectacular orchids and it is absolutely gorgeous. And I just love this picture. It's one of Tom's best mm -hmm. ever. And I'll let you can go to the next again. We got quite a few. You can see where they're growing. It's it's there's not much else on there. Um, there's a lot of moss, and there was some of the round leaf uh, sundews. Um, they were on on and and smaller ferns. Nothing big that was going to block out the sun. And the mats do move around. Not all of them, but because when I found it with my friend Diane, the mats had had blown no. into shore and oh. they were right on the shoreline <laughs> and there used to be a, a rotting log right along the shoreline that had the two kinds of orchids on it. I mean, we never looked for that Arethusa then because we didn't know there was three orchids <laughs> and um, you can go to the next one. And uh, this is actually a wrap up picture of um, the, well, it's it's one of the mats, and it, it's got all three. I think it has all three orchids on it. I can't remember, but uh, I think that's the last slide. I think there was one. I think. Oh, oh yes. 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 Um, yeah. I'm a steward at the Depot Creek Nature Reserve up Highway 38, and um, every year, um, and being a steward, we always check various things, and one of them is. There's cattle pond. There are cattle in that field. And so when you get farther into where the trails are, you have to close the gate so the cattle don't get in there. Um, there's some pretty rare plants there. But anyway, uh, we usually caught some frogs and, um, and um, can't think of it. Oh, Ann Robinson, she was in charge of us. And we count the toes to make sure because the farmer had used some kind of herbicide and we always wanted to make sure there was no mm. aberrations in, in the frogs. And um, we had a person that was an expert what was in the pond. Um, so they'd be netting stuff out of the pond. And so I was looking for a frog and I just walked up from the pond and just almost stepped on this orchid. I could not believe it. It's Potanthra lacera. So I never got a picture of it, but I knew Paul McKenzie had gotten a photograph. So I emailed him and he was kind enough to send me the picture. So um, hmm. Simon okay. put it in at the end because I have, I've found a few orchids since, um, you know, I hiked with Tom and Dora, but they're, um, I don't have pictures of them. I've got one from, I think it's Buttermilk Falls and it's, uh, um, <coughs> it's, one of the it's, it's one of the sporanthes, but it's uh, lucida. And uh, anyway, I don't have a picture of it. It's with John Poland. We were after the Hackberry Emperor that day, a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And then um, I I did have hooker eye in in uh, Rock Dunder, but I didn't take a photograph because I'm not very good at taking pictures. They always don't turn out. And so and then this one that's the the last mm -hmm. one I found. I let Paul McKenzie, or not Paul McKenzie, Dr. Paul Catling know about these. And he was always really happy when I tell him where different orchids grew. He'd say, oh, I don't have a record of that orchid from that mm -hmm. area. So he would always thank me. And it was it was really wonderful to meet him and his wife and talk about an eye. So we're walking in, he spotted the Goodyear pubescence. He also found a putty root leaf. Hmm. <laughs> and he would ask us, do you know this? And you don't know that. And the other thing that was kind of neat is we found out that um, we had a mutual friend in Ben. Because hmm. he, he knew Ben quite well. Oh, nice. or could, so that was kind of exciting. Anyway, he is retired now. So I, I don't talk to him as much. And that's the end. I don't know if anybody has any questions. If you want to know how to find orchids, you got. I do have a list of some books too, if you're interested in books. Oh, and I have. I just have um, another little thing here to talk about. Um, okay. Orchids are one of the largest group of plants, and they've got like twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand uh, species worldwide, and they grow from the tropics to well north of the Arctic Circle. Um, from sea level to 5,000 meters in elevation. So 
Orchids produce the smallest seeds of any flowering plant with a typical seed pod holding hundreds, thousands, even millions of seeds. And the seeds are covered by a, a thin protective cellular uh, coating, but it lacks, the seeds lack a stored food source. So they're light and they're, they're distributed a lot by, you know, the wind and rain and water and so forth. Um, but they, a lot of them are lost and there's a very low, high rate of loss. So with no self-contained food source, the seed requires a fungus that grows in the soil. And the fungus um, enters the seeds, um, well, it, it enters the seed attaching itself to the embryo and provides nutrients necessary for the seed to germinate and grow. So all our native orchids, which are uh, terrestrial orchids, form lifelong partnerships with this fungus and through a relationship known as mycorrhizal. And so it needs these nearly invisible fungi are vital to the growth of the orchid. And that's why you should never dig up an orchid unless it's being threatened. If there's a road going through, yes, you can always take a chance. But that mycorrhizal fungus isn't everywhere. So um, a lot of people dig up an orchid and they plant it and expect it to grow mm -hmm. and it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and the other thing on pollination, in addition to bees, butterflies and gnats and moths and wasps, pollination is, is assisted by hummingbirds too in the wind and the rain. But when all else fails, there's self-pollination. But when a pollinator that pollinates a certain orchid, when it dies, the orchid disappears too, which is really awful. And I think that might be happening with climate mm -hmm. warming because I haven't seen as many orchids in Frontenac Park um, and, and around as I have at other times. So I can take any questions. Yes, please, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, for, for that's a presentation. <laughs> it's always so Thank entertaining you. and so educational. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So yes, if there are uh, some questions, uh, please uh, speak up. Thanks. There's uh, some faint noise, but um, please, anybody, or put them in the chat, and we can take them from there. But. Uh, Hi, that was a great presentation. I was just wondering, I'm, I'm not sure if I maybe missed it at the beginning, but what was it that first gravitated you towards studying orchids? Um, I was bird watching with a friend up near Mountain Grove. There's trails in the woods and uh, we were watching an osprey come in with a fish. And when we were driving out, um, I just happened to look in the woods and I yelled at him, stop the truck, stop the truck. And I got out, I found my first wild orchid. It was the yellow lady slipper. And I was so enchanted by this orchid. I determined I'd like to find as many orchids that grow in the Kingston region. And by the Kingston region, it's west to Brighton, north to Smith Falls and east to Brockville. And I, I have other orchids that I have found, but I don't have pictures. I have found the prairie fringed orchid down near Brockville with Ben when he was here. Uh, ben has a house in um, um, Parham, but it's falling apart. It was, it was left to his wife by um, Dr. Milton because she's Dr. Milton's daughter. And anyway, they're gonna have to do something with it. So he's planning to come back next summer. So we hope to do some more orchidizing back then. Mm -hmm. He really wants to go and see the um, the coral root. That's right. Everybody wants to see that one because it's so rare. Yes. Anyway, does that answer your question? It was seeing the first yellow lady slipper. It was so exotic growing in this wood. It looked like it shouldn't be there because it's just so different than all the other, you know, native plants in the, around in that area. Absolutely. They're absolutely beautiful flowers and you have such amazing pictures to showcase them. Well, Thank that's you. all thanks to Tom, which is incredible. And uh, unfortunately, Tom um, was the youngest of the three of us that did all the hiking and, and monitoring of different things. And he died first. And Dora has moved to Prince George. So I'm, I'm now here by myself mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to find people to hike with. Well, and um, yeah. I mean, I, I do have people that are interested, but I don't like to show people where the orchids grow because 
I'm always afraid they're going to dig them up, but there are some wonderful spots around here where, where you can see orchids and, and it's just a matter of and the best thing to do is get an orchid book, read up on where they grow, and then you can go and find that spot mm -hmm. and 10 to 1, you'll find an orchid there. So not all the time, but um, but a lot of times you just have to know the habitat and the blooming time for those orchids. Maureen, I don't have a question, but I want to say thank you for the great presentation. Oh, you're okay. welcome, Chantel. <laughs> um, that's uh, just ask a quick question. Uh, so thanks very much again. Yeah. Is there a book you would recommend for people who want to learn more? Oh boy, <laughs> there's there's one I would recommend, but it's out of print. It's been out of print forever. Mm -hmm. It's called Our Wild Orchids. It's by Frank Morris and Edward Ames, and it was printed in 1929. Wow. And uh, I think Edward Ames was the guy with the camera. He did photographs, and that man, they hiked high and low. That man carried a box camera and a tripod with him all through where they were, you know, uh, looking for orchids. And um, how they got together, the two couples, there was a couple um, in the States, and I can't remember which ones are the American ones, and they were looking for ram's head. And mm -hmm. it just so happened that the Canadian people who lived around Peterborough found ram's head orchid. So somehow, some they told someone, and someone told the people in the states, or they found out about it, and the two couples got together and they formed a partnership that was forever. So the wives hiked with them, mm -hmm. and their adventures are just amazing. They never say, like one of them, the photographer fell in the water, and he never says, you know, the guy's name. He just says one of us fell off the bridge into the water. <laughs> it, it's so funny the way he writes it. It's very old fashioned, but the descriptions of the orchids, they were amateurs, but it's amazing. But there are other good books. Um, I wrote some of them down. There's Orchids of the North Woods by Kim and Cindy um, Reason. And that's a fairly, it's an American book, but it, it's, uh, you know, the same things grow here as grow around the other Great Lakes. And A Guide to the Orchids of Gray and Bruce Co County, and that was produced by the Bruce Gray Plant Committee, Owen Sound Field Naturalist. And it's very, very good because they have a lot of orchids up there. And then Orchids of Ontario by um, uh, Emerson Whiting and Paul, Paul Catlin. Right. It's an older book. And uh, there's Wild Orchids Across North America, a botanical travelogue by Philip Keenan. It's okay, but it's not as good as the others. And that's pretty well it. There is an old orchid book that is in print again, um, Bob Trotting for Orchids by um, GG, I can't remember her last name, but uh, it was written about the same time as, as Morrison right. Ames. Wow. And she talks mm -hmm. about. Um, you know, the Regenia, just picking them because for graduation and everything, oh my God, she goes out with the basket and digs them up, mm. digs all these things up. She didn't, you know, but anyway, um, right, it was good. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, see, we have, Did Mr. Uh, yes, that's in the um, yes. uh, Mr. Purden, he found them on his property and he wasn't sure what they were. And when he found out that <laughs> they were quite rare, then he asked people to come in and um, they just kept, you know, uh, propagating more of them all the time from the seeds. They made sure uh, this Marilyn Light, she was one of the ones that helped do it. But the Mississippi Valley, uh, they had different people in there that, uh, you know, actually they, clear, you know, kept it clear because it is a fan where there's water moving all the time. And there's, it's a really interesting place. If It's up near Perth. Um, if you Google it, they'll tell you exactly um, where to go, but it, it is it is a wonderful place. It's just the orchids are incredible. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's Dora. Thank you. Thanks. Dora, did you want to say a word? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much to Maureen. That was a great overview of the orchids in the park. And for me, it sure brought back a lot of memories oh, of boy. Booking. Like seven years of hiking together, Dora, and doing the frog monitoring at night in the dark. And and uh, that was my most exciting thing, I think, is in the dark and doing the, you know, the salamanders. And oh, my gosh, before they disappear, they're mole, mole salamanders. So they're only in the spring milk ponds for a very short time to mate. And then they're back underground again where you never see them unless you happen to 
turn over a log mm -hmm. or they're yeah. under, but, mm -hmm. but that's kind of rare. So yeah, it would bring back memories, definitely. Okay. Yes. Um, I've got the transcript. I couldn't see that. Well, I think that's everybody. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thanks again. One more. One more. Any. Any more questions? So. Uh, thanks. We've got so, another. Okay. We've got one more. Yeah, we have another yeah, presentation. Yes. Speakers. So yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much again um, oh, for an excellent talk and, and uh, say so, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, hoping that. Uh, we, we can stimulate more interest in natural history and, and sort of perhaps oh, uh, gosh, perpetuate the, the work you've done. If they could find some yes. of these orchids, yes. they might be stimulated yes. <laughs> because yes. they're so incredibly beautiful. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Right. Exotic looking for, mm -hmm. you know, this area. Yes, thanks. Well, well th thanks so much again. And I'll mention um, uh, the donation um, that uh, we had offered for uh, Maureen uh, to give to an organization in her name. She's actually kindly offered to donate uh, the money that we would have done to the Outdoor Shelter Fund. So thank you very much for that, Maureen. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>